technology is that uh, we're showing promises results returning the uh, regards uh, regarding the, the dampening or elimination of this uh, uh, drop to vortex uh, that is often a, a limiting operating uh, or limiting the operating range on uh, on uh, transit turbines. Yes, I forgot to mention this that we will uh, will record this and and this will be uh, also made available uh, afterwards. The electrical engineering team were focusing on in particular on this uh, variable speed drives with full converters, and they show that uh, conventional uh, salient pole machines or so the traditional uh, synchronous machines used in most uh, hydropower plants. They can be converted uh, to variable speed units uh, when they are equipped with a fully, uh, fully sized uh, frequency converter and, and then they design so that they can manage with sufficient uh, filters or, or uh, different uh, types of converter topologies so to make sure that they can manage the, the high frequency uh, noise that these are generators that can be damaging to the uh, state windings. So it has some negative impact, but there are ways, to found ways to, to design and optimize so that they can utilize this. And they also show that uh, these variable speed units with modern control algorithms, they can provide additional uh, services to the grid, such as this path frequency response, where, where you can play it with the, with the uh, frequency of, or let the unit pick up that part fast uh, response. Finally, on the, uh, mod, on the environmental and social acceptance size, uh, team was developing uh, modern computer tools so they can simulate how different operating conditions and different hydrology impacts uh, the risk for stranding and the risk, uh, the mortality on, uh, in particular on the, the uh, small fish and eggs and, and uh, etc. And how they can find a trade-off between this uh, need for ra rapid ramping and, and at the same time manage the, the mortality on the fish. <laughs> Initial testing was done on this idea, this occurs so of using a kind of a uh, large uh, reservoir downstream of the power plant uh, with the compressed air and then balancing the, the flow rates or, or smoothing out the variations in flow rate. Uh, has potential for high head plants, so showing that for, for low head plants, it's unlikely that this technology will be applicable, but it can be applicable for high end plants. But uh, so the, at the moment, only a technical evaluation was done, so a full feasibility taking also into account the uh, financial side is needed to, to see if they further evaluate uh, the viability of this technology. The uh, social exception, ex acceptance work show that stakeholders are generally positive uh, towards flexible operation uh, as long as practical issues of that safety uh, and impact on their, their uh, environment is taken into account. And the most important was to involve also all the local stakeholders uh, early on so that it does not come as a surprise, but that they feel that they have an engagement and involvement in the process and changing the operating pattern. That was a very brief uh, summary of uh, some of the, the key results that came out of this uh, work related to the Francis uh, work, Francis turbine work uh, in uh, work package uh, three. 
a very frequent and recurrent uh, question has been, what is the impact of this changing uh, operating pattern on existing turbines also, or on the new turbines? And can we predict uh, the development and degradation of these units as the operating patterns are changed, as the market are uh, driving these changes? So as an addition to the normal uh, or to the, the uh, uh, workshop where we covered the complete scope of uh, the Hydroflex project, this workshop today, we want to dig a little bit more detail into um, reliability modeling. Uh, what have we achieved so far in terms of understanding what is the impact on operating pattern and how can we as we are trying to develop new and uh, research projects and, and ideas, what are the some of the uh, let's say odd forward uh, in this topic? So before we're going more directly into the uh, into the hydropower specific work. I'm very happy to uh, welcome Vigo Pedersen uh, from NTNU here to, to present some of the, his thoughts on degradation models. I've known Vigo for quite a long time from he was working in uh, Trendernagi and we were working together also on this uh, guide to the machinery uh, directly uh, and i'm very happy that you can be here and present some of your ideas to us here welcome it's, it's my pleasure Gilma, yes you see the black one there maybe you could take down the yeah or something. okay let's see if we, if we can sorry i'll see yeah. again okay i'll try to do that so uh, on one is is Conning. There are two of us. So he's he's about to enter. Here he comes. On to one. Uh, we've already forgiven you. <laughs> so on to one, I think people will listen. And in case you have any questions, he will be glad to help and to answer them. I say that Antoine is a brain in the outset, so and he's uh, he he's quite knowledgeable on, on modeling. Okay, I've tried to to show you here the the, how can I say it, the development in maintenance, and I say we are about here predictive maintenance. Prescriptive is maybe the next step coming off that scientists are talking about. Then you don't only have the predictions, but also suggestions from the machine on how to handle your, your maintenance. So uh, let's see, the two of us that has put this together is Antoine. He's a colleague of mine at the department. And then um, read yourself here about his interest. And uh, my name is, is Vigo. We work at the same department. So the intention here now is to try to raise some, I say, reflection on degradation modeling. I just remember about Ross Fleming, Mary Andrew Hagen. We talked about it and before it was. So what is, so if we can move that one a little bit. Yes, that's it. So, so to have a degradation model, what, what, what's the aim of <clears throat> Sorry, sorry, yeah. Any experts on uh, Zoom? No. Uh, you will only click here, you can move it one of the sides. Okay, oh yeah, yeah. 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 Try that one. So, 
I can't even ask yourself, what's the aim of the model? Estimate. Excuse me, uh, Vigo? Technical issues. Is there, hello? Well, we can you hear me? Time, but can you really isolate any of that? We talked about being able to on social technical issues. They will interact. They will influence on each other. There is a relationship between that. But anyway, and, and that adds to the complexity of the model. So again, how do you define the scope of your model? What I have seen is that any hydro power plant uh, operation is, is normally aiming at uh, achieving optimal dependability. Would that be correct? Optimal. Cool. Can, you, can you hear me? You agree on that? I'm used to students, so I always ask questions. So, Vigo, uh, can, you, can you hear me, Vigo? Let's see how now. Hmm. Yes, I can. Vigo, can you hear me? It is somehow not working. Okay. There's a battery, maybe. No, no, I think it's. If, no, since I was, uh, I was taking over the uh, screen. Let's see. Um, Jonah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, now? Yeah. Jonah? Yeah. Yeah. Vigo, it's better if you can stand here because if you have the microphone here for the people online okay. so they can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I'm used to another thing up there. That's the yeah. room where <laughs> you have this. Uh, 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 technical system. So. Okay. Uh, dependability. It has many phases. You have the reliability, but it's also influenced on by the maintainability. That is, re reliability is about when it goes out, the item. Maintainability is how long it would take you to get up and running again when you're down. And of course, then you've got maintenance support. How are you able to organize your resources in such a way that you will get up and running fast. And that can, can uh, have uh, quite an impact on the dependability, how these factors work together. So maintainability, that's the ability of an item under given conditions to be retained in or restored to a, a state in which it can perform a required function when maintenance is performed under given conditions. And I guess you know better than I do that you can have a quick fix or you can have a, a slow fix depending on how you're designing it. So, and then of course, now we have a new issue that uh, is hitting us quite heavily, spares, availability of spares. So how is this reflected in your model, if it is? Then this maintenance support performance, that's uh, the ability of, of an organization to have the correct maintenance support at the necessary place to perform the required maintenance activity when it is required. A lot of organizations, they have resources, but maybe they don't use them efficiently. That will add to your build time. How is that? reflected in your, your model. I'm just raising some questions here for you to reflect. On. So what are we talking about? A, a more generic model that will capture several incidents or, or, or parameters. Reliability. <clears throat> there are, or you can look at the re reliability from different perspectives. Is it the operational one? And the operational one is the actual reliability of an item, uh, considering operation modes, which might vary from time to time. Is that correct? It is correct. Operating conditions and, and possible preventive maintenance actions and so on. All of this will influence the life of your item. 
you put on that one? Some of you do at least. Yeah. And then which one is reflected in, in your model? We can use different key performance indicators to, to describe reliability. I guess you're all familiar with these ones, like failure rates, probability of function, availability, life expectancy, and so on. And then we have this rule. Is it well defined? Is this the definition of measures? It's definitely a subject estimate of how long an item can be expected to fulfill its required function, given the fact that the condition of the item is known at the time of the estimate. All, all of this is and maybe must be based on, on uh, condition data and analysis of it. And of course, you have you have different ways of collecting your your condition data. What we call, at least at the university, subjective and objective ways. Subjective uh, um, ways would be like me and you doing a visual effect. And we might see two different things or things completely different. When you do measurements using uh, vibration monitoring, then you have maybe a more objective, you have more objective data. So that will influence too. And then at the end of the day, can your degradation be monitored? Is it possible? I seem to remember. We had this uh, incident in Cleveland. It is no secret. So what happened over there? They installed a new runner, and I think it was running for was it five or eight hours before it cracked. So <laughs> then, did it happen slow enough to be observed? Well, in that case. <laughs> What, how could a degradation model help you in that case? And then you have again, can the degradation be measured and monitored? Is it possible? Do you have a method? Vibration as well? Or what? And at which level do you monitor your degradation? I guess you're all familiar with, uh, with these uh, how can I put it? This uh, this figure here, when you have both condition and time, then you've got a required requirement, and then you will have your degradation of failure. That's an incident. And then you move to some kind of a state, error stage, for instance. And then you can have different levels of degradation, level one, two, three, four. And often you would be interested in for how long will you live in in uh, in uh, condition one, two, and three, and so on. And in most cases, <clears throat> at the time you uh, where the item lives in in a, in, a, in a certain condition, will get smaller and smaller until you hit this one. And then next question is: Is that one well defined? Not always. So. There's another interesting question I see, or we see on Paul. That is failure hierarchy. So what shall the model be based on? Condition data. Failure mode, just that it fails or it's okay. Or do we go all the way down here? What is supposed to be down here is, let's see, it is the failure mechanism. Do you base your model on failure mode, just as it has, yes or no, or the mechanism behind it, the root cause? And then, if so, how many are there? And how do they interact? 
Which one will get you first? Are you with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the threshold, how bad is that? How do you determine that? I say that can be a serious seller. No, man, he agrees with you. So, no, but it's, it's kind of important to have some feedback so I can see that we all of that. Right. And then, which data are available? I mean, it's, you, you cannot just put a sensor somewhere and start measuring. You have to make sure that what you measure on will tell you something about the condition of the item. And then you have all these things happening here. Uh, you, uh, what do you call it? You, you, uh, as a perception, as a amplification. Amplification. You amplify your signal, you turn it from uh, uh, this um, voltage, maybe, to uh, this digital signal, zero to one, to do that several times. So what do you end up with over here for your analysis? The real condition over here or something else? And we all know what happens if you have, for instance, uh, you, you measure a voltage over a long circuit. You know the influence from, uh, from magnetic fields, from digital signals. You can flip the ones and the zeros. So, so again, does the measured value represent the real condition in the process? Do we know the uncertainties in the measurement chain? And are failures in the measurement chain eliminated? False positive, false negatives, and we see the nuclear model. And then maybe the one that everybody is hunting for are data from failure situations available. Can you calibrate your little model against failure data? Do you have such a thing? Or something we talked about in that one, close to a failure situation. Oh, God, this is what. So, and then remove. Ooh. Yeah, before we talk about that sensor accidents, I found this report. It goes, it's from the 90s until 2011. It's, it's uh, from a French governmental body, I think. They reported uh, an increase in what they call sensor accidents. Less people out in the process facilities observing what's going on, depend on sensors, and then at the end of the day, even the sensor pay. I'll try to describe another one that uh, I was in Denmark and we talked about this wind turbine. They decided that they wanted to keep track on the condition of the wind turbine. So they increased the number of sensors significantly. And then they said, we don't need to visit that much. What do you think of? This is 24.50%. One. Sensor failure. So how do you handle that redundancy on the sensor? I, I, Not bad. He's coming with a what's your call it? Microphone? Speaker, Camera? Yeah. Camera. Camera. So I shouldn't turn my back on that. <laughs> it's not gonna kill you. <laughs> so would it be okay if I stand over here? 
This is a camera. What is that? That is a camera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have to keep that in mind. I have to keep that in mind. And then rule. Remain useful life. Normally, in maintenance engineering, it's looked upon as a random variable. I cannot say the value with uh, certainty. Say something, we can say something about the probability of rule means that it is not an accurate thing. It is like when I had, we were discussing, I think it was the actual mean time to fail. So they, the mean time to fail had been calculated and assessed. It, it is never right. And <laughs> so uh, the end there, what, what, what does it mean? It, it's the mean time. So same thing here. So, um, we haven't been able to identify that we have not a certain definition of rule. Okay. So what could it be? Remaining time until the failure rate is too high. Breath the better, better correct. Or is it an estimate of the survival function of lifetime data? Like you do with the pop on there. Or is it something else? Anyway, in order to establish some kind of a model, you will need condition data. There are approaches, and this one, uh, the trend estimate, we will look a little on it. I say it's what's used today. This was used today. It's what we I call the simplified model. I say even the Vikings used it. They looked at their ships and they did some to got some data on them, looked at uh, how often the boat was and so on. And then they said, based on this, it will last the so and so. Now we use sensors. So we, we have maybe more accurate model. And then we have these statistical mathematical models. My understanding is that you use some kind of Markov models here. Is that correct, Jana? Mm. Then you've got Wiener processes and a uh, number of possible approaches. And then we have, of course, got machine learning. And I say supervised learning. That's, that's uh, the one used here. Uh, and then you've got regression techniques, and what's the other one I'm for? Classification. Classification, yeah. So we can have a brief look at this. This is taken from, um, we, we have installed some vibration monitoring equipment at uh, different uh, uh, processes at Antanu. It's a vibration process. Here, you can see the curve down here on the vibration. And then we have a lower threshold and an upper threshold. Then the question would be, how long does it take you to get from, or us to get from lower threshold to upper threshold once we, we hit the lower threshold? So in another way, it's, it's something like this. So we could, for instance, use Excel or something, and then just, ask Excel to be able to forecast on a straight line. Then the inclination of this line would uh, be the difficult uh, part of, of, uh, of the analysis. Is that right? That would be the different uh, difficult part. But then again, how accurate does it have to be? Do you need to know if you're Runner will fail you in 25 years, one week, and two days. Hmm. So, what is the value added from your heuristic? Here is another one. We have in our lab a rotor kit, 
That's the Bentley Nevada kit with a motor, electrical motor, shaft, bearings on that shaft. So what we've done then is to run the rig in normal operating conditions. Then we mistreat it a little bit. We give it some uh, oil with silicium carbide in it. And then we measure how long does it take uh, the vibration level to increase. Then we go through these different phases here from collecting the data, filtering, doing all of this stuff with the signal. Then we try to extract some details. Then we try to rank, and then we do the final model. Quite a complex process. Quite a complex process. Yeah. So in any of these models, we, we presuppose that we have available condition data cleaned and represented. That's a big job before you get there. It is a big job. And you can imagine as the failure development is observed, the uncertainty described by all these different possible paths uh, will uh, be reduced. And we can add several uh, contemporaneous, contemporaneous condition parameters. Then the question will be, which one of them will get the run up first? If we are talking about Francis Ramos, Francis. But then, like in Markov chains, there are questions. We do simplifications, don't we? A lot of simplifications. We say, for instance, that the future state depends only on the current state. Is that a fact? Are you able to detect the current state? Is there something hidden there due to previous operation patterns that will suddenly get you at some given time, point in time? So, and if that's the fact, how do you capture that one? So, the question is simplifications and assumptions, how do they influence the estimate of your model? And how do you determine the thresholds here. Yeah. Like for vibration monitoring, I guess many of you are familiar with them, with that. We have like the ISO 10816 standard, I think it is. They will give you an indication of what a uh, threshold should be. In many cases, you can see that's conservative. So maybe at the end of the day, you want to set your own threshold based on your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, if you have like this, I think this is a process. So um, still, the challenge is to calibrate those process to, uh, processes against failure data. We generated the failure ourselves in the laboratory. Of course, that's not a real thing. Have to keep that in mind. Machine learning. Antoine, he is into this. And he always tells me that people do not expect magic from this. So, uh, and again, you depend heavily on availability of sufficiently many good condition data. And we are talking amounts and huh? amounts of data. And it's just another way of doing statistics, isn't it? Organizing uh, your, your numbers in a certain way, classifying them, doing a regression analysis on that. So, and again, it's the same story all the time. Raw data, need data for your analysis. 
And then you need to clean all of that. And then there are tons of models out there. Tons of models. You have to, to, to pick the right one. Different models will give different results. Hmm. And also, <coughs> I'm sorry. It's, this is complex stuff. These models have to be maintained by someone. And then at the end of the day, if you decide on implementing such a thing, do you have the infrastructure there? Do you have the measurement chain, chains available so you can feed the data, the, the model with data? Yeah. And then we have, I've been extremely negative this time. <laughs> it's, uh, we will not, uh, we will not uh, end like that. But these are questions I say that should be raised for reflection. Yeah. So again, to summarize, try to summarize at least. Is the infrastructure for mon monitoring the feature there? I say many companies and many power stations, they do not necessarily have uh, infrastructure there to collect it. Am I right? I am right. So you have to invest in that one. That's, that's part of, of the game here. And then in case you have such a thing, have, are the data being collected and, and uh, stored for future use. And if so, what kind of data do you have? Tons of data showing you uh, uh, a normal operating condition without any problems. Most probably, yes. And uh, the failure situations or, or near failure situations, no question. Is it then possible to build a generic model for accurate rule estimation? Well, I say that the challenges would be access to comparable condition data. <laughs> and I say that different power stations, they have different failure mechanisms. Is that correct, Henry? He doesn't disagree at <laughs> so we have old design and we have new design. I say new design tend to be more fragile. Why is that so? Because you push the limits for this efficiency of your runner. You make your blades summer, you, you challenge the limits, don't you? That's what's so. And uh, I won't go into details with this Grima incident but we could see a significant difference on the thickness of the blades from the thing that cracked and the one that they used to replace significant. And all stuff is often sledgehammer stuff. The turbine wheel had been sitting since, I think, 73, was replaced in 2006 something. And then after eight, eight hours, uh, well, it went wrong. Yeah. And then how many failures do you have in these power stations? Not many. I remember my, the manager I had, he, he told me, well, this never fails. It works all the time. We never have, we, we, we almost never had any failures yet. So, but if it happens like in Driva, it was not a pleasant situation. You know, to take this thing apart, two weeks, put in the new wheel and straighten everything up, another three weeks. If you have a wheel for a replacement, if not, you might have to wait one year. So, but there is a question there. Are algorithms change. So do computer systems. Will your model 
be continuously upgraded for 50 years? And my understanding of one, this is a challenge, for instance, in France, in this avionic and nuclear industry. Is, is that right? Different terms. It's a challenge. Somebody has to do it. The machine doesn't do it for me. So the question would then, can you go simple and get the same result? Does the trend give you a good estimate on vibration, for instance? Is that good enough for you? And this is less vulnerable. Hmm. Yeah. And then I guess somebody will have to pay at the end of the day. What would be the MTD of your model? But then, not to be too negative, trending post monitor, somebody has to pay for that too. So there is always the cost. But we are almost there now. Big progresses have been made in model. Definitely. I can uh, mention briefly, try to mention briefly, if we have still have time for that. When I was working in the oil industry in the 1980s, we didn't have 3D modeling on piping installation. So one day they put the pipe up, next day down, because it was all these collisions all the time. Uh, we didn't have all these um, modeling possibilities to optimize the design. So safety factors, they were up there and you had uh, and you used more material and it became more costly than it had to be. We are also talking environmental issues here, which I think will be very important. Do not use more than you need. And it goes for everything. <clears throat> <coughs> Uh, computation capability and computational power has increased significantly. I say like the measure, the uh, collection of data that we do with the SKF, the EMX system, it was not possible just a few years ago. So big progress has been made there. So we have systems for collecting data and analyzing them like the Internet of Things, has opened a lot more possibilities than we had before. Also, the same goes for machine learning, and it's heavily used. You see it even when you go in your and, and try to buy something. Like I use Autodoc a lot to buy stress in my car. So if I buy a certain item, they come back and ask me, don't you want this in addition? So, and that's machine learning in practice. So some industries they they use it or yeah some industries they use it uh, extensively yeah and the efficiency has increased in the design processes because now you're able to model and check or or how can I put it mitigate maybe possible failures on the machine not in practice. Well, the CFD models used for this free bar thing, but I guess they have been improved, I bet. Yeah, they have been improved. So then there is another thing to it that might be very useful. Increase, when you do the modeling, you increase, or it is possible to increase the understanding of the system that you model. You can maybe identify more weaknesses. You can even use the model to forecast possible behavior. If you mistreat your runner or a wind turbine or something, you can use like digital twins to forecast the behavior and thus avoid at least some unwanted incidents. Yeah, from given operational conditions. Yeah. So 
But at the end of the day, we suggest that you never forget that a model is not a reality. There is always the unexpected. Always the unexpected. But at least then you have something to improve. You have something to improve on. So, and the, the uncertainty, it will always be, no matter how you do this. But then there is also this, this question in, uh, that, that has to be raised to syndrome. Do you understand the model? And uh, of course, like Diana, uh, you have a lot of brilliant people in your organization that can help you such things. Can the hydropower can handle a hydropower can a company can handle it? No, they took the 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 the, the people for that. So who is going to be in charge here? Who do you want to depend on? So, and to use Antoine's words, do not expect magic from a model. That would be the final remark from me at least. So if you have any questions, we would be glad to answer them this time. Yes, thank you. Okay. Anyone have any questions there? I have one question myself because um, you have this figure with showing the, the instrument failures. And I think a lot of, of um, hydropower management, they, they use this kind of uh, figure to argue why. This one, no? Huh? Exactly, yes. So I, I think that one, we should have like a normalized because I mean, I suspect if you have normalized it with a number of installed instruments in the same time, this case would be very different. I think it's uh, quite paradoxically, at least the way, maybe it's different, but, but uh, in the way in the hydropower industry, we're very often afraid of, uh, of, of instruments because, oh, it might be this instrument failure instead. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> instrument failure instead, yes. Uh, I know there was um, 10 years ago, there was built a new power plant, the uh, Embrex was close to drama. And I think what the power company said was that there was more instrumentation on their overhead crane than on their uh, actual unit that was producing <laughs> power. So, so, how do you see, are there other industries that are this afraid of instrumentation as the high power business is? Or how do we convince the uh, industry to be more open to, to uh, instrumentation? May I? Yeah, sure. I've, I've been working in the oil industry for many years, like uh, auto. We sold all kinds of things to ignore a lot more than they needed. Uh, and uh, the thing there was that they didn't use, they didn't use all the data that they collected. So I said, in, I say in that industry, my experience is over instrumentation, and then maybe they, they just put. It, but that's because they have they have so much money in that industry, they don't need to be concerned about money. But my understanding is, like, I was working in Thunder and I won't say too many bad things about them, but they were very cautious with money, and they had to, because the price of, of electricity it changes. And um, you have the owners, they are always in serious lack of money in the, at least in Norway, the public uh, or government policies. So that was, was, that's what I've seen in the, in the offshore industry. Too much data. So. But isn't, but that's a question then to you. I, I think it's, too much data is a key requisite for, for uh, then starting to try to develop more sophisticated models. If you always are struggling to get uh, the data, and we always have to liquidate data, we, we which, cannot move forward. <laughs> which, what I, and, and my understanding is they, they do invest in that. Yeah. So I don't know, Antoine, what 
can we say about the pipe? Well, in general, I mean, that it's an equation that is cross industry. That is that we need more data and we need more relevant data. Because as Vigo said, for instance, in agronomic industry, they record <coughs> all what they can on every flight, on every aircraft uh, uh, flying in the world. Does it, is it useful? They, they are really terabytes of data, but what can they do with that? For the most part, nothing. So we, we, we really need good data and sufficiently uh, many good data. That means that we need to have measuring systems there, but as soon as you add a measuring system, you add also complexity, and the measuring system itself has to be maintained, and its viability, reliability, blah, 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 has to be assessed. So it's, as usual, it's a matter of balance. Hmm. Yeah. So, so yes, we need measuring system, we need good measuring system, we need to measure accurately relevant indicators, but we have to pay for it, and so it's hmm. a matter of balance. And then again, maybe failure data. That's, is, would that be maybe the challenge to get failure data or close to failure situation for calibrating our model? So ordinary operational data, enormous quantities. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree, but I think, uh, um, but again, I mean, I understand that it's a trade-off, but you could say that uh, if you have this huge amount of, uh, of data, for instance, from, from flight, or if you say that you had all, you had a lot of more instrumentation on all hydro turbines, so there are few who fail, but if you had only ever had that instrumentation from the start, if you had some kind of strain gauges on the blades or all the blades or some other kind of crack detection device, for nine out of 10 cases, uh, you will, and maybe, so it may be the instrumentation of the last for let's say one year or so, but you can at least pick up that startup period. And I think that the added uh, cost uh, of that instrumentation is much less than the outage cost when something happens. I mean, yes, just a comment on that because uh, a lot of your models here is linear models. You can detect temperature rising in the bearings, vibrations in the bearings, which will have maybe a linear tendency. But these material failures, as in Viva, very hard to detect it. The material breaks. There's a uh, so the complexity in this model, it will be a lot of parts of this uh, complex model for the whole system that will not have a linear tendency, it will be sudden tendency and these ones are really difficult to model and to, to detect properly. Hmm. Uh, just to kind of pick up on the cost issue, I think that that is one of the big issues in the industry because the the fleet of the industry industry is so large and they lack most of them lack the infrastructure to actually feed this data forward to anything and if you want to make a specialized case for one power plant that's one thing but personally i think that we're gonna we're gonna see a trend where they're gonna sit on the fence until somebody makes a model that works and then they're going to start paying because they don't see the value of this because we can make the loftiest promises, but we don't have any proof that this will actually work anyway. So I think that's basically just demo cases is what is needed to get this thing up and running. <coughs> yeah. Can you say something on that one? Uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh... When you speak about reliability, of course you are you are paying money right now to avoid costs, possible costs in the future, and this is something managers cannot understand. So, uh, uh, basically, uh, hi Eric. I I always have this example. About, uh, are you able to share your screen? Uh, yes. Uh... Hold on just a second. Oh no, I need you to stop sharing first. And uh, 
these uh, 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 these stones are, are called tsunami ishi. So in Japanese, ishi means stones, and tsunami means tsunami. Uh, and these stones have been there to show where the tsunami, where the, 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 the water came uh, during the tsunami. And if you look in the Fukushima region, there are several stones that are way more inland than uh, the, 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 the actual place where the, the last tsunami was destroyed in the Fukushima plant, uh, where the water came when, when there was the accident. So that means that in human history, they were in Fukushima region at least one tsunami that way that was way more severe than the one they experienced for the Fukushima. But they are forgotten. They didn't use the information. No, they didn't use the information. So that, that's uh, uh, you're right. I mean that uh, the equation is always related to cost and to uh, what you remember, what you are set to pay to avoid possible failure. And this is, uh, I, I kind of agree with you, but also I, I want to raise a little point is that uh, if you put in place some, some safety system that prevents accidents, you will not prevent accidents that will occur for sure. You prevent accidents that may occur. And so, how do you ensure that you prevent anything? And then how do you calculate the net present value? Yeah, it's very, very complex problem. Thank you very much again to Vigo and Nathan. We continue on. We, sorry, we, are both <laughs> we understand, but uh, thank you very much for yeah. attending, and, and I hope it will uh, be in contact afterwards. Uh, Starcraft has been a company that's been uh, working with and initiating a lot of the work on, on both on, on uh, PhD students, the master student research project, and also internal work on on reliability modeling, understanding failures. I'm very happy that uh, Eric uh, Viborg from Statkraft can be uh, virtually present to, to present some of the work that they have been uh, doing and some of their ideas. Uh, please, Eric, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, in person. Uh, this is less than optimal, but next time. Also, I. I I'd like to share my video, but I'm afraid that my bandwidth it doesn't cover it well enough. So just to mm -hmm. have a clear and beautiful voice, I'll, you won't be able to see me. But I, I yeah, it's not a big deal, I think. Uh, is, the, is the sound OK? Yes, it's OK. That is a yes. If I can try it to okay. try it. Okay, so uh, Vigo told us not to expect uh, a metric from a model. I, yeah, I agree. Um, we we uh, we'd like to have something magical to tell us uh, exactly how long something will last if we continue the like you want, but. The thing is that there's so many factors, so many variables, so much that should go into these models to have them accurate and and reliable, and and all centered in the middle of the of the. This it was really an excellent uh, intro to my presentation, Vigo. The your presentation is very good. So uh, keep the wall uh, shiva, the dart thing in mind. We want to hit the center, but because all of these variables uh, come into play here, it's hard. And what makes it worse, what makes it worse is that they come from uh, different departments, and 
IT systems and, and, and uh, tools and, and there's so many versions and uh, it's hard to incorporate data that wasn't supposed to be incorporated into a larger system, which makes this, uh, this lifetime predicting system is, well, is really too complicated to make. That's why we, we can't really do it for now. So how to eat an elephant? I eat it one piece at the time. So if we start with something simple, something generic, and, and accepting that something super generic and some super simple that we can apply to anything is not going to give us good results. But and we've we've thrown around the world uh, the word um, uh, infrastructure a bit, but th that's important, right? We need to get the infrastructure up and running to be able to exploit the uh, the information that we get, the data that we get. So start somewhere simple, and and then we could complicate things a bit and add information, add um, new models, new information. And, and make them work together to improve uh, the results going from guesstimation to estimation. So this was the idea uh, and, and behind uh, an initiative that we started a year ago plus. And uh, these, these boxes would be made up of functional mock-up uh, units are based on the FMI standard, which does what it looks like. It, it takes any any model, uh, make it as complicated as you want or as complex and demanding as you want, but any model will have some sort of more or less simple input and 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 a set of output that should be usable for people. And if you you structure them in a way that's uh, meant to be put into place into some sort of a modular environment, like a puzzle piece, then we've reached a, a big important goal, I think. So uh, we want to try out this FMI standard and uh, uh, the generic life uh, initiative uh, was uh, was started with the goal of creating just a really, really basic, simple uh, foundation upon which we could build more with this uh, puzzle piece in mind, right? So there were some, there are some requirements, uh, both in terms of what we need to accomplish to make this work, but also in terms of what a company would have to have in place uh, so that this could be exploited in a good way. So we'd start with this uh, FMI standard and the idea that from the get-go, any result, any uh, model that we got would have to fit into a larger environment of information and data. Uh, through these FMUs uh, is at least what we thought would be a good idea. It turns out that was a good bet. It uh, turns out FMUs aren't that complicated, uh, but more on that later. Um, so we'd have this environment on, upon which we could build more uh, sophisticated models, but for them to properly interact we need to have a standardized information model so that they could speak to each other and uh, information would be named the same wherever you were in this environment. And also so that collected data and, and uh, supplied and resulting data would, would fit into this uh, standardized information model. So that's uh, one more thing. And then uh, also, of course, data needs to be available. 
we have to have a database and an information uh, system that would provide us with data in this standardized information model way also. Uh, and then in the end, um, information, no, sorry, the results of these results need to be followed up. They need to be, um, well, they need to be worked on. If if you end up by creating this excellent um, model, which provides us with valuable results, it's all for nothing if the results are just put in a drawer and, and never really acknowledged, and never followed up. So, but this is a more complex uh, problem, something that's more on uh, corporate digestion of information and, and uh, yeah, but a little bit more on that later. But so the, these are kind of the base requirements. And again, this is a whole lot to take in uh, and a lot of really, really different and really complicated problems. So again, one piece at the time, let's start with just uh, the first step. So getting the, these uh, puzzle pieces together and see if it works. Now we had four, no, sorry, five students work on different uh, parts of uh, the, the main unit. And so we were working on uh, the residual lifetime of the, uh, a turbine or a runner uh, based on something super generic, something that we have already, so that start stops and the amount of time it was running on part load. Uh, also working for the turbine on uh, when the optimum time for rehab uh, would come and more on the financial uh, side. So focus on, on a market, uh, um, yeah, a market situation and stuff. Then we do something or we were hoping to do something equivalent to the generator, uh, just based on starts and stops. And then uh, for the uh, the main valve, we were thinking more in terms of the optimized maintenance. So uh, time to rehab, uh, no, sorry, yeah. Time to rehab, time to uh, change components, more on the condition monitoring side. But all of these were meant to be created as possible pieces in a larger uh, environment so that they would be able to uh, to uh, turn data into information really is what we want this is what this this environment is all about and creating something valuable uh, out of the data the mantra being that we wanted to have as I said modular ways of increasing knowledge and again, as we were talking about just before now, there's a lot of data that's available, uh, right, which isn't really being used. So it's really the point here. Let's start the takeaways from, from the, the work that the students did. So first off, the generator isn't <laughs> like a runner. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so when, when we were working on how to um, to deal with the general lifetime of a generator, there's actually three different pieces. The state of winding and core and poles are, are different pieces that are hand, handled uh, separately. And it doesn't really work the same way. So that was a bit of an issue. Uh, the poor the three girls doing this, this, uh, 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 this, analysis for their project needn't had to do a, like a full 360 on their uh, not a 360 that would make them come back to the same place but 180 uh, and so instead of working on just um, ma material degradation they work on pure statistics which is always always useful always a neat place to fall back on um, and so they made a statistical model, which can be used to predict uh, the, the degradation of the generator, but it's really what it does is digitalizing the 
kind of feeling of the experts on site because it would be based on historical uh, condition evaluation made by uh, our colleagues, which turns out to be sensitive uh, information. So we couldn't share it with them for, for girls, but the model still works and the system is still valid and also very, very important because and we, we have all our, our colleagues working on, on site who are familiar with the, the machines and who have a sort of a, a sixth sense, uh, which is impossible really to duplicate uh, unless you've been for another human, unless you've been working with them for so and so long. So we wanted to digitalize this and this is a good way to do that. Statistics is, yeah. So something to think about, but it needs a lot of work. Creating a, an AI for this is, is difficult. Um, then on the turbine side, there, that was more of a success uh, using the SN curves, working with uh, tensile strength and, and um, uh, yeah, all, all the, the classic just focusing on uh, material strength worked pretty well. Um, yeah, and uh, also, even though we work with uh, with prototypes, all our runners are prototypes and they, they live different lives and all have different um, uh, different maintenance and different loads and different loads history. So they will all be different individuals, but collecting all the data in a sensible way and being able to create a good database to pull from would, would be valuable. Anyway, um, Another good thing that came out of the, the work here was that it turns out that FNUs aren't really that hard. Uh, it's, it's just when you, uh, you just need to understand the basic concepts. So again, very good thing. And uh, work for the, or with the, the uh, inlet valve, uh, we wanted to exploit an idea that came up in the uh, Monitor X project which I, I know that some of you participated in. Um, and uh, it, it is based on big data analysis, um, supervised learning, which works, obviously. Well, this, uh, no doubt that was, the, it, it's a good idea. You get an automated analysis, you get automated warnings and they're, they're tailored and it's, it takes a little bit of time to to do this this uh, machine learning, but once it's there, you have an automated uh, control system, which is really really good. And for our components that last so for so long, and who don't really, as as also mentioned before, uh, they they don't really fail that much. So they're just left alone, and nobody really takes care of watching and, and looking for uh, degradation in, in this way. So having that automated for a cheap price, because it is really going to be super cheap, as long as you have the infrastructure set up and the data is collected and you just have a machine-based algorithm, or not obviously, you have an algorithm that does this, this controlling for you, you'll have you can just forget about it. It's going to be done automatically and and you'll have so much better control of your equipment. Uh, from a more general point of view, um, we, we initiated this, uh, but we don't really have a good digital environment into which they could plug uh, their their FMUs, their their uh, systems. Right now, we're working on it, but it, for now we don't have. We're a bit lacking, so um, we couldn't really test how efficiently they these FMUs work together. Um, so that's 
to be continued. But the principles were there. The principles were sound. And again, the idea uh, that the creation of information based on data uh, has a value. It's so obvious. It's obvious, I assume, for most people in this room and for people in general. But it's uh, it. This should be stressed more, and the importance of doing this automatically, of not having to uh, to have a, an engineer do the translation of data into information for every single case, just. Um, and, and we can't do this preemptively. We can't have one engineer do all this processing uh, for uh, for the, our machine park. It needs to be done automatically. So our goal is this, um, back to our requirements, where it seemed that this module-based improvement system is a good idea, uh, no surprise there, but there's still a lot of work to be done information modeling and uh, data availability and uh, implementation of the results of an analysis is also a huge task that we have. Uh, but now comes the part where we're looking into the future and we have this ORCA project with the most tortured uh, name ever, just to make this goal. Yeah, but never mind. Uh, the idea behind Orca is to work on data collection infrastructure, and Vigo also uh, mentioned uh, IoT, which we're not we're not using that much. Again, it's not. We need something really safe and reliable. So this is talking more industrial uh, industrial data collection systems uh, with with uh, foolproof and safe. I'm not saying IT is always unsafe. Uh, it's not the Wild West, but we need something really reliable and, and more heavy duty than uh, than uh, this. These uh, well, it depends on tasks, of course. Um, but that's really where we have a, a lot of focus on. So, how to collect data, how that should be done, how to present and gather and structure a master data for our uh, uh, our systems. We're hoping to work more on the uh, IEC's common data dictionary system, uh, working on asset modeling. Uh, here, of course, uh, the RDS will play a big role. Also for signal modeling, where the RDS and 61 will work together and give us a standardized system that would work hopefully from the asset level uh, already from communication protocol level all the way up to uh, full exploitation in the market systems of the, the data so that it could keep one name all the way through our information channel uh condition monitoring that's uh, uh camilla's specialty and more now, there's a whole lot of uh, brain that needs to be added to, to us. So we need uh, skilled people. We need also, the, these are new um, new domains uh, for, for the hydro business that we haven't really worked with before. Systems engineering and information modeling, uh, ontologies, all of these key concepts are as far as I know, quite new to us, but we need to adopt them to be able to really handle the data and to and, uh, create this automated digestion of data so that we can exploit the uh, data better. And to do this, of course, the core will be cooperation, working together and agreeing upon which standards to use, agreeing on naming conventions, agreeing on on the, this whole information chain and making it standardized. That's it for me. Thank you, uh, Eric. We'll open.
for some uh, questions from the audience here. One one question from my side uh, initially. Uh, this this Orca project is that uh, stop draft uh, project or is it more uh, uh, multi party project? It is, it is, it is. It's it's a Starcraft project. It's also uh, the um, our internal projects uh, towards uh, the the uh, smart draft initiative. Okay, thank you. Question from the poll. Uh, Eric, ha have you been able to introduce this to uh, to Stockcraft? Uh, I mean the, the FMU FMI standard. Uh, it's oh, we talked a little bit about it. <laughs> uh, we're doing baby steps here, so uh, uh, I, I um, there's a lot of these steps, a lot of what we talked about that needs to uh, that, that needs work and uh i i not mean resistance or anything uh, uh this, this is where quite the opposite it's uh, a lot of thumbs up a lot of uh, but it, it requires a lot of work to implement these new systems and new ideas into a company that's a little short on on power uh but we're getting there you should turn off your video because you're it's you're coming and going when the sound is really bad. Yeah, sorry. So no, what what I was saying is that it's been it's been introduced and not really tested yet. Okay. Uh, another question, Eric. Maybe you you're the best on or Bjarne and me maybe also able to to answer it. is do you know of any other companies that has introduced that standard it's uh i think it's in the backbone of the uh our manufacturing industry as far as i know yeah. uh, I, I think i understood at least um, but we're introducing a whole lot of new concepts for our business so we <laughs> Uh, I, I hope it will be uh, be uh, tested up properly. But again, and as also as um, the uh, the generic life uh, project has has shown, it, it needs the proper environment to test it out. You need to have an information environment to keep it in place so that that you have the uh, uh, someone to put your uh, your puzzles. And we're working on it right now, so it gets there. We will for sure test it uh, in Hydrosen uh, in this uh, digitalization project we are using now. And I think we will also try to introduce use it more together with the students uh, that are coming. So I hope, I think that we will, it will be used a lot more, at least from the research side in Norway. Good. Good. good, good. Just, just to add, I mean, I can confirm also what Eric was saying that in other industries, in particular in transportation, both uh, both uh, cars and more heavy duty uh, transportation vehicles, it's it's very commonly used, uh, and also for uh, control systems for aviation. And in addition, on this um, work that's being done in uh, Grun Oy, I think uh, the work that uh, the University of Southeastern Norway is working on uh, with Modelica, then it's very easily at least uh, to, to swap out parts with FMU and, and collect them with FMUs as well. So uh, I think it's a very interesting avenue to investigate further. Again, thank you yes. very much, uh, Eric. Uh, we'll, uh, for everyone online, we'll have uh, 20 minutes. Um,